Good morning, Story family. Really fired up to see y'all here today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of the story today. If it's um, your 100th time at the story or your first, uh, it's just really special to see everybody gather together. I will say this is our second week in this um, facility, in this address. Uh, week one was amazing. Uh, went off without a hitch. No technology failures whatsoever. Week two, not so much. Not so much today. You guys probably didn't even know it, but basically everything has gone wrong on the tech side today, except for the fog machine. That still works, apparently, because we were rocking that thing today. But other than that, everything else has gone wrong. And that's just, I think it comes with the territory. You know, it really begs the question. Sometimes we have to ask, like, is it the devil shutting us down because what we're doing is so good? Or if is it God shutting us down because we need to rethink, you know, things? I don't know. I'm going to often say it's the, the enemy working through the, uh, through the wires and things today. Here's the deal. We have no live stream today. So I'm really glad you all came in person. Otherwise, there would be no church at home today, at least not on the stories feed. So um, the, the really great part of that is that about 30 minutes ago, Pastor Kale over at Timber Grove learned that he was going to be preaching today, live and in person, instead of getting my sermon on video. So we had a fun little chat right before the service started, talked him off the ledge a bit, and uh, y'all pray for Kale, who's probably getting ready to preach a sermon he had no idea he was going to preach um, an hour ago. So uh, he'll be fine. He's ordained now. He'll be fine. So... Um, it's really exciting to welcome all of you here. This is week two at our new home. It's wonderful to see what God is doing. Uh, we sort of had our, our soft opening last weekend. The grand opening probably won't be until we go into the big sanctuary across the hall when it's ready sometime next year. It's going to be a thing to behold. It's going to be a beautiful uh, uh, occasion, an event to remember, and so look forward to that. Um, now, last weekend, in addition to being week one of our, our new home, um, we didn't just have worship. We, we had uh, what was called a family shared with us um, what God has revealed to them about families and uh, about masculinity. That's really the two main topics that they hit on. Both of those topics are near to my heart right now in my life in ministry, in my life at home. Like I'm thinking a lot about what the purpose of a family is. And um, sort of what my purpose as a man is, who I'm here to be, what masculinity looks like from a biblical point of view. And Jeremy really just crushed it on the podcast. I sat down with him for one of our first interviews in our new studio um, here uh, at our new home, which is, uh, I'll show you a picture. That's the, the picture of us together. I encourage you to check out the interview in its entirety on the podcast, Maybe God Podcast is the name of our in-house podcast, Maybe God. You can also find it on YouTube, Maybe God Podcast on the YouTube channel. Um, and it was like an hour-long conversation, and he just crushed it on those two topics, family and masculinity. And basically, I can sum up his sort of argument this way. The way he sees us in our culture today looking at family and thus looking at masculinity because how we see men is a direct result of how we see the family. I can say more about that in a minute, but he really gets into it in the podcast. We look at the family primarily as a nest. <clears throat> and in the nest... The purpose of the family is to what? Get the little ones to do what? Out of the nest, you know? It's like whatever it takes, just get them out of the nest. That's what success looks like in the nest model of the family. And there's nothing inherently wrong or evil about that, but it's lacking, especially when compared to how we should look at family from a biblical perspective. It is a lacking way of looking at the family and the purpose of the family. What to do in a nest. Most men don't. Look at most nests in nature. They're made for, usually for the mama and the babies. And so where does the, where does the guy, the man, the, the father fit into the nest? I think this is where we get a lot of men feeling out of place in their own homes you know, the old trope where a man comes home from work and goes out to the shed and does woodworking, really throwing back a sixer probably, just to get away from the nest because he's like, it's like a foreign territory to him. He doesn't know what he's here for other than just providing. There's got to be more than that. Well, 
Jeremy says we should, if we look biblically at the history of families in the Bible, we should just disavow ourselves of the notion that family is a nest. And instead, we should see our families as a team, like a multi-generational team on a mission together to serve the Lord. That's basically how he sums it up. And the beautiful, one of the beautiful things about looking at your family as a team rather than the nest is that it changes the name of the game. You're not just trying to get your little ones out of the nest so that you can have an empty nest and be obsolete for the rest of your life. That's not how it works if it's a team. If it's a team, the parenting keeps going beyond your kids entering into adulthood. And so launching your kids successfully into the world isn't the only goal. And that's good because I think there's a better goal than just launching your kids successfully into this world. And it grieves me to know there are so many parents in this room, if I'm just being honest, so many Christian parents who, if we're real honest, if you're given the choice between having a kid, a son or a daughter, 25-year-old son or a daughter, who is a college graduate, graduated with honors, maybe did grad school, is now taken in a, a position with Goldman Sachs in New York City, but no, they haven't been to church in a few years. Given that choice versus a 25-year-old son or daughter who dropped out of college and hadn't quite figured out what they want to do with their lives, they're still living at home, but they are madly in love with Jesus. Who do you think most parents would choose? And maybe I need to get a glass of wine in you to get you to tell me the truth. <laughs> because maybe we're ashamed to admit which of those kids we would choose. Goldman Sachs over Jesus. The, the, the nest model where we just want to launch successful individuals into the world basically reduces Jesus to like an elective course that a kid can take or not along the way to this better journey. It's wrong. And so if we look at family not like a nest, but like a multi-generational team on a mission, we're able to put first things first because what is our mission? We're here to serve across generations. We're here to serve the Lord together, whatever that looks like, college degree or not, Goldman Sachs job or not, doesn't matter as long as we're serving the Lord together. You can serve the Lord at Goldman Sachs, by the way. You can serve the Lord at college. You can do all kinds of wonderful things, chasing that stuff, but serving the Lord should be the goal for the family, especially families that are trying to follow Jesus together. Now, the, the, the best part of this, I think, is that it clears up the father's role. I'm not here to just be a substitute mother in the nest. That's how a lot of fathers feel. A substitute deficient mother. When mom needs time with her friends, dad fills in and tries to make dinner and everybody laughs and has a good chuckle and then goes back to playing video games until mom gets home. Like that's how the nest works. But if it's a team, I get to be the coach. And I may not know first thing about nesting, but I love to be a coach. I've been a coach at the little league level for several years of my life. Nothing brought me more joy than Little League coaching. I would still be coaching Little League to this day if I had a kid in that age range and if the league would lift the ban. But uh, I don't know what they're thinking. I think I've learned my lesson, but it's up to them. <clears throat> I am intense about coaching. I couldn't care less about nesting. And it just occurred to me as Jeremy was teaching, if I brought that same intensity to leading my family, things might change on the home front in ways I've been praying for. If I saw myself as the, the head coach of this family, pouring into them, preparing them, particularly preparing them to face a world that will at times be hostile to them because of the name of Jesus that they're living under, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this world in every time and place will turn against them. This world is hostile to the pure gospel of Jesus. Even in an open-minded, tolerant, whatever, culture like ours, yes, they'll let you be religious, but if you get serious about the gospel, we have an enemy that will come for you. And, and I think that's the best thing about being the coach of your family. 
The church is the same way. The church, God set it up to be a family. And so I think the, in particular, the men of the church are called upon to be coaches in this family and to um, prepare our church folks, young and old, to face this enemy unafraid. That's what Jeremy taught me in a nutshell, and, and I've been thinking about it um, all week. And as we've learned through this series called Acts of the Apostles, um, which, is a, which is a 26 weeks journey through the book of Acts, um, we have seen that the more serious and intense the Christians got about sharing the gospel of Jesus, the more intense their opposition became. And the devil entered in and used all sorts of people, even religious people, uh, to get in the way and to silence the men and women who had been called into the church. So let's get into it today. Uh, part 10 of this series will focus on Acts chapter 5. Verse 17 is where we'll begin. You all have study guides. You can follow along. Is it just me or is the AC broken too? Is that another technology that's not working today? Okay, fun. This is fun. All right. Whew. All right, Acts 5, verse 17. Then the high priest and all of his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. We're going to stop there. So the high priest and the Sadducees. High priest was a Sadducee, and the Sadducees were the uh, leading faction within Judaism. They had the power in every Jewish institution of the day. The Sanhedrin was majority Sadducee. Um, the temple leadership, majority Sadducee. They were the elites, the sophisticates, the highfalutin, highly educated, sophisticated men who looked down their noses at other kinds of Jews who believed what unsophisticated Jews believed. So, so Sadducees didn't believe in some of the supernatural things like resurrection of the dead. That's why they didn't buy what Jesus was selling about, and the disciples about resurrection. They didn't believe in it. They were too smart. And here we see the Sadducees are beginning to turn on the apostles out of what? Jealousy is what we see. Jealousy, which is a really pathetic emotion for men of such renown and intellect jealousy that they feel toward the apostles. Now, why were they so jealous? If you look up a few verses, you'll see it. In verse 14 of the same chapter, it says, more and more men believed in the Lord and were added to their number, the number of the church. Why were the Sadducees jealous of the apostles? Numbers. Numbers. Isn't that why everybody gets jealous? I'm a pastor. I'm here to confess. That's why pastors get jealous. Numbers. Now, I'll tell you what, I've known so many, I've been this pastor in the past, actually, where you just, <laughs> you never saw a great big church that you liked. There's always something wrong with great big churches. Pastor is a charlatan, prosperity gospel, you know, it's just the, it's all about the lights and the TV and the fog machine, it's just, it's just pomp and circumstance or whatever. It's like, we just want to criticize and tear down because their numbers are bigger than ours. Pastors might be the most jealous breed of people across the whole earth. Even though I know it's not just pastors, I know a lot of pastors who are that way. I know a lot of pastors who have great big churches, buildings at least, that they are leading. Um, you know, they have more pews than people sometimes. And then they hear about, you know, some country bumpkin out in Montgomery County, some pastor, Billy Bob, that everybody's talking about who started a church in a tent or in a big red barn, called it a cowboy church, and now it's standing room only every Sunday. And, and once in a while, somebody in their church will go, you know, my granddaughter went to cowboy church and loved it. Why can't we be more like them? And it just, just eats them alive <laughs> from the inside. Pastor, Pastor Billy Bob just can't be, you know, tolerated in this way. It's just, it's just jealousy eating them alive. It gets even worse when they learn that Pastor Billy Bob didn't go to college, didn't go to seminary, doesn't own a robe or a stole, and when he teaches on the book of Revelation, he calls it Revelations, like an idiot with an S on the end, and it just drives them crazy. <laughs> it really gets under their skin, um, and the enemy enters in in that exact moment to try and tear the church apart to try and claim the soul of a pastor 
and his congregation by way of jealousy. And they can't make sense of it. They think they deserve the success that other men are getting. And I just offer this little part of the sermon up to say if you're someone who struggles with jealousy, if you find it difficult to applaud other people's successes because you're envious, you think you deserve that success more than they do, it's gut check time. Because the enemy loves to use jealousy to subvert God's plans for our salvation and our discipleship. And if you find it difficult to applaud others or to be happy for other people, it's time to look in the mirror. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says, A satisfied heart gives life to the flesh, but jealousy makes your bones rot. It will eat you alive. It will decay you from within. So watch out for jealousy. It's what, it's what really brought these Sadducees into Satan's will. Acts 5, verse 18. Let's continue. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. This is a little God's uh, sense of humor shining through, I think. Who does the Lord use to subvert the will of people who don't believe in angels? An angel, of course. It's what he does. I've learned a couple things over the years with this God of ours. He always wins, and he'll usually have a laugh in the process. He's kind of a, he's kind of a poet and a prankster in a way, and he uses an angel to uh, subvert and, uh, and resist these angel deniers, the Sadducees. The angel said, go, stand in the temple courts, tell the people, tell people all about this new life. All about this new life. And at daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they'd been told and began to teach the people. I love the way the angel phrased that because it's so interesting. Just tell the people all about this new life. What new life? Like Peter and the others were grown men. They were the same men as they'd always been, were they not? They had the same family names, the same, you know, jobs in many cases. They were the same men, Right? No, if you're a student of Scripture, I encourage you to go back and read, for example, the way Peter spoke before, before the book of Acts and the way he spoke after. Before the book of Acts, in the Gospels, Peter was like a bumbling fool, always saying the wrong thing, always speaking when he shouldn't, keeping silent when he shouldn't, like always missing the point. And then Peter had his one big fall from grace at the trial of Jesus, and then the church was born soon after, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, and Peter became a preacher, eloquent, sophisticated sounding, to the point he cut the most educated men to the heart with his words. No, these men were no longer the same men. Something was new. What was it that made them new? Well, it was the Holy Spirit. It's the whole book of Acts, right? The Holy Spirit is what made these men new. And Jesus said it this way in, Act, in John chapter 6, verse 63. Uh, and then I'm going to skip to verse 68. It says, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of life and the spirit and life. Full of the spirit and life. Who is it that gives life? The spirit gives new life. If it's not the case for you that you can look at your life and see um, a before and after when it comes to your life before Jesus and your life after, if you're a Christian, you're not, you're not alone, by the way. This is you. If you're a Christian and Jesus has made a nice change in your life, he's re rearranged your schedule a little and, and your relationships are healthier, he's kind of like a therapist on steroids. Like, if that's who Jesus is for you, that's fine. But I'm telling you, you're missing the Holy Spirit. You have yet to receive the Spirit of God. You've yet to be baptized by the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity. It is in the moment that the Spirit comes upon you and dwells within you that you begin to see the bifurcation of your life as it was and your life as it is. I look back on my life before, before the Holy Spirit came upon me 10 years ago this year, and I'm like, I was not the same guy before. I wasn't. Once in a while, that old man will come back, and I'll just have to deny him and remind him he's not who I am anymore. 
but I speak differently. I prioritize differently. My mind is different. My passions are different. The way I handle every facet of my life is now Holy Spirit infused. My new nature is that of Christ by way of the Holy Spirit. My human nature that was fallen and sinful is taking a back seat. I'm a new man. I thank God every day. It's not my own doing. It's not like I just got enough of Jesus' therapy that I figured it out. I'm a new man, and I thank God every day, and I pray the same for every believer. That's the life that the angels, that the angel um, um, sent the apostles to teach all the people about. And that's what's missing, by the way when preachers get jealous of Pastor Billy Bob. They think Billy Bob must be a smooth operator. They think he must be slick and handsome. They think he must be charming and charismatic. That that cowboy church in Montgomery County is not blowing up because of Billy Bob. It has nothing to do with Billy Bob and everything to do with the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who grows churches sustainably over the long haul. Not flashes in the pan, we see rise and fall, but it is the Holy Spirit who draws people in. It is the Holy Spirit who makes churches attractive to believers and unbelievers alike. And the Holy Spirit only seems to show up at churches that surrender in obedience to the will of God and get our own personalities and opinions and politics out of the way and allow the Holy Spirit to show us God's word, to show us God's will, even if people on left and the right and whoever come after us and hate us for it, we're just going to be people of the truth as it is given to us in the word of God and interpret to us through the Holy Spirit. That is how we are made new. The Holy Spirit comes and calls us to surrender, calls us to repent and to receive him. Um, Repentance is the operative word there. As we're going to see, repentance is what ratchets up the pressure from the enemy on the church even now. Right? You can be a Christian and be faithful in every way, but never talk about repentance. And in some cases, the enemy will leave you alone. But the moment you get serious about the gospel, which starts always with repentance... You'll see. You'll see the fangs come out. And so did the apostles in the first generation church. Let's keep reading Acts 5, verse 21 now. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, one inside. Whoops, they were gone. And so on hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard, who was at the temple, like inside the... Uh, the, the gathering uh, place of the temple, the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. So in their minds, these guys got away, and they're in hiding somewhere out in the country probably, back in Galilee maybe. But then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts. They're right outside. They're right outside right now teaching the people. And that, at that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They didn't use force because they feared that the people would stone them. And the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel, this is the point, that he might bring Israel to what? Repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things so that the Holy, so, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. feels like a cowboy church in here, like a barn. I'm going to get dehydrated up here. I like it, though. I kind of like it. I know it doesn't look good on camera, but the cameras are off today. So what am I going to do? 
look at the look at the difference, the change in the Sadducees. At first, they're just jealous. But after the enemy enters in and uses their jealousy against them, and after the, the, the apostles called them out on their sin and called them to repentance, how did their attitude change? They no longer were just jealous. They wanted those men dead. And I know we don't live in a day and age where people are coming for our heads because we're Christians, and that's great. I'm glad for that. But I still have experienced the hostility of this fallen, broken world that is so often under the influence of our enemy, Satan. I've I've experienced the hostility that comes uniquely and specifically when Christians break out the R word. Repent. Repentance. That's why most Christians don't even use that word anymore. That's exactly the way the enemy wants it. He wants us to think calling the world to repentance is the stuff of um, the unsophisticated sidewalk preacher. When it is, in fact, the business of every believer, every follower of Jesus. The only difference in how we think about it and how it really is, is that we usually think about sidewalk preachers casting judgment on everybody else. And true repentance begins at home with me looking in the mirror. I repent first before I call anyone else to repentance. And when I call others to repentance, I'm clear about the fact that I am in a process of repentance too. Because I'm the worst sinner that I know. But that doesn't stop me from being truthful about sin and repentance. And the fact is that the world, broadly speaking, doesn't like hearing about sin. The world doesn't like being reminded of sin and being called to repentance. The world writ large doesn't, but I promise you there's someone, one or two individuals in your sphere of influence who are dying for you to call them out. The world, your social media followers might not like hearing you talk about repentance and their need for repentance, but there's one or two friends or family members in your life right now who are dying for you to be honest with them about sin and repentance. It's the most loving thing you can do. And these apostles were trying to do the same. They weren't being hateful toward the Sadducees when they said, you guys helped put Jesus on the cross. Own it. Confess it. Repent. It's said in the same passage that the point of it was to bring them to repentance and forgiveness so they could be part of what God was doing in Israel and beyond. I mean, look, the fact is you can't have the gospel without a strong theology of sin, without talking about sin, and without talking about repentance. I'm urging you to find ways of weaving that word back into your own vocabulary, back into your own lexicon so that you use it on a regular basis and not just here at church. The reason the gospel of Jesus is so offensive to the world has to do with this very topic. Jesus said it, it's not me. John chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, The world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. That's why the world hates Jesus. Now he'll let you be reli- the, the world will let you be religious. The world will let you be a polite religious seriously. The enemy will start taking you seriously. And that's why we need to be prepared and intentional about preparing one another in our families and in our churches. There's this great uh, man, a church father by the name of Athanasius of Alexandria. Athanasius was uh, born and raised in Egypt. A lot of people don't know that um, Africa really serves as the, the cradle of Christianity in the earliest days is where... The church uh, really grew in northern Africa, and uh, uh, Athanasius was an African um, bishop. Uh, he was appointed as bishop numerous times, um, and he had to be reappointed because the emperors of Rome kept unappointing him and uh, sending him into exile. He spent 15 or 17 years in exile in various places because he repeated the inconvenient truth of the gospel, which is repent of your sin. Repent of your sin and be forgiven. And he wouldn't stop saying that, even to Christians in the church. And so some of the people that canceled or tried to cancel Athanasius were his brethren in the church, which still happens to this day. Christians are used by the enemy sometimes to cancel other Christians. It's the wildest thing. 
But the more the world tried to silence Athanasius, the more he spoke up. The more opposition he faced, the more courage that he had. And he is known to this day for saying one thing in particular. Um, I mean, his, uh, his nickname now is Athanasius Contramundum, Athanasius against the world. And this is why. He once said, if the world is against the truth, then I am against the world. And I don't believe he said this with an ounce of hatred or spite or resentment in his heart. With all the love of Christ, we cannot simultaneously be full friends with a fallen world. So we have to be ready, prepared to fight a spiritual battle and to teach others to do the same. I'll finish up with these last few verses of Acts 5. It says um, his speech, and that, that's a reference to Gamaliel. Um, there's a great story about Gamaliel here. I just don't have time to get into it. Um, you can do this study on your own. Gamaliel persuaded the Sanhedrin not to kill the apostles, basically. And uh, we'll circle back to Gamaliel later in the series, um, in a few weeks. So the, the Sanhedrin then called the apostles in and just had them flogged a little bit. Like, we're not going to kill them, but we're going we're gonna to knock you around a little bit. We're going we're gonna to have you whipped. And then they ordered the apostles not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And then the apostles left the Sanhedrin. Because they were under such pressure, they never spoke the name of Jesus. Wait, wait a minute. They weren't pressured into silence, were they? They weren't scared into submission, were they? The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because, this is crazy, because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Imagine being so in love with your Savior that suffering for his name is worthy of rejoicing in your mind and in your heart. Imagine being so passionate about the gospel of Jesus and how it changes lives that you're willing to risk it all reputation, time, treasure, all of it, all of it for the purpose of sharing the true and whole gospel of Jesus with your friends and family. Imagine rejoicing daily at the thought of being counted worthy for suffering, disgrace for his name. If your family is just a nest, you'll never get there. You'll never get here. If your family is just a nest, you'll tiptoe around the periphery of what we're talking about today and call yourself a Christian family and launch individual little heretics into the world and then hope they find the Lord again one day. But if your family is a multi-generational team on a mission together to serve the Lord, and men, if you're the coach of your family, then you've got a clear mission here to raise up, lead, prepare, pray for your team, to lift them up and disciple them, to prepare to face down this world that will make an enemy of them. And in the life of the Story Church, I'm asking myself that, and I'm encouraging all of you to ask yourselves this about what the Lord has done in our midst. I'm so glad and grateful that we have a home now. We don't have to worry about where we're going to go next. But man, I pray that we never make of this home a nest. We can commit the same errors that local individual families can by just hoping to raise young people that are good, nice young citizens and then they leave the nest and go off to college. Isn't that nice? No. We're raising up a team, an army of spiritual warriors who will go out and advance the kingdom of Christ and share the whole gospel of Jesus, even if it costs them something. That's what we're about here. And a nest can't contain such a movement, I pray, that we will see ourselves as a team, a multi-generational team on a mission to serve the Lord together. Let's pray together. Father, we put this church in your hands. We put the story, church, in your hands. 
And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to show up and be poured out on us and in us, Lord. Pray that you would keep us all humble and obedient, that you would give us your heart, Lord, that you would remove from us every sin that needs to go, that you would call us to the mat when we need to be called out on our sins and our patterns that are destroying us and those in our spheres of influence. I pray that you would call us out, especially the men in the room who have been lulled into a slumber by a way of looking at the world that reduces them to mere worker bees and providers instead of leaders and coaches. Lord, I pray that you would awaken entire generations of men and by virtue of awakening them, that you would awaken everyone in their sphere of influence, in their homes. Lord, and that we would see a movement of your Holy Spirit take shape across this city. Lord, I pray for the day that some city official would come into our church and say what those city officials said in Jerusalem. You are filling this city with the name of Jesus. I long for that day, Lord. And should we ever take for granted a gift like this building, should we ever reduce it down to something like a nest, an incubator, where we just try to be pleasant believers who raise pleasant believers and have worldly success, Lord, I pray that you would remove this gift from us and send us out again until we learn what it really means to be your people, called out, taking risks, putting it all on the line for the sake of living under your banner, for your name, advancing your kingdom. God, help us to be courageous as the first Christians were in the book of Acts. Lord, we want just a share of that courage today, Lord. We thank you for all your many blessings, and we pray together as one body in Jesus' name. Amen.